Hey, thanks for uh, praying with me. I wanted to uh, uh, ask you if you would turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 12. That's where we left off. Sunday mornings through the Bible, uh, we go back and forth between Old Testament and New Testament. We're currently in the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel, and we left off with chapter 12. There's ushers coming down the aisles with Bibles. If you need one, just get their attention. Wave your hand and uh, put it in your hand. And we even mark the place for it. And there's a bookmark you can keep. And in case you're not familiar with your Bible, or the Bell Bible, I should say, then uh, you can find your place there. There's, there's no shame in learning these things. All of us were there. So Second uh, um, Samuel, look it up in the table of contents if you have to. Chapter 12 is where we're at. <clears throat> Lots of us have, uh, or I should say probably have, scars from uh, injuries and dumb things that we've done uh, in the past. And I was just reminded that my, my, my finger won't straighten out completely uh, because of something dumb I did when I was a young man. And I've got other stuff, you know, you, you might have uh, things like that. I was watching uh, some YouTube videos with my kids the other day, and it was of other kids crashing into stuff. You know, and they didn't really get that hurt. But as I was watching these videos, I was the whole time I'm thinking, oh, that's going to leave a mark. <laughs> Ouch, you know, you know what I'm talking about, banging their heads and, and stuff. And, you know, you end up with a, a cut here that never goes away because of something uh, that you did that, that, that leaves a scar. Well, there's those physical things, obviously, but then there's emotional scars and, and spiritual ones because of sin that people invite into their life and, and just do dumb things that they shouldn't be doing. And, um, and those things leave marks too. And sometimes they're permanent marks, scars. And uh, that's what we see here with King David. We left right in the middle of his uh, dilemma that he's put himself in because he began to walk in darkness. And so, so the Lord urges us to not be like him, and that's one of the reasons why this is here in the Bible, so that you and I would walk in the light. So that's why I titled this message, uh, Walk in the Light, and then I sub, the subtitle is, or it's going to leave a mark, okay? Uh, it's going to leave a mark if you don't walk in the light. You know, um, God wants us, if, if, if we do mess up and stray, that we will repent quickly and not be stubborn because you're not going to get away with it anyway. That we would accept responsibility when we've done wrong. You know, one thing that I think this chapter will bless you if you're a Christian here today is that not only to avoid the mistakes that we see King David make, but if you do fall into sin, that you would know that God won't leave you there. He's kind to deal with you. He doesn't want you to ruin yourself. And so he urges us to um, come back, get back on the path, walk in the light, and not stay in the darkness. And so in order to illustrate that and convince you of that, uh, there's four phases that I want to take you through in this chapter um, to get sinners back in the light. Maybe you're in that place right now where you're in a mess of your own making. Or that you might remember this for the future and, or help someone else with it. There's four phases to get uh, believers like David back into the light. And we would walk in the light. And that's where I'll spend most of the time. But maybe you're not a Christian yet and you're here today. Well, I want you to know that God's going to show you your need for forgiveness too. And why it's vital for your future that you would repent and turn to Jesus in faith. Okay? So with that, here in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, walk in the light or it's going to leave a mark. We'll start with our first phase 
and that's, I call it confrontation. So number one, we'll have the, uh, uh, the outline for you here. Number one is confrontation. And here's what we're told. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. Okay, so I need to stop here for a moment to kind of get us up to speed on what's happened. Because in chapter 11, we found uh, King David had committed adultery with his friend Uriah's wife, this gal named Bathsheba. And because of this uh, thing that they did, they, she became uh, pregnant. And so, in order to cover it up, David didn't want to expose himself and the ridicule and, and you know, the, the broken laws of God that he tried to uh, get Uriah to go home. You see, Uriah was out in battle, and, and David had him brought back home, and he tried to get him to go home so that he would be with his wife, and then, you know, maybe Uriah would think that he was the father now of this child because it was early in the pregnancy. Right? But Uriah wouldn't have anything to do with it. He wouldn't leave his brothers in the battle, so he, never, he wouldn't go home, right? So in order to cover up what he had done, David had um, Uriah uh, killed in battle. He put him in the front line of the hottest uh, battle and the whole thing just to, to cover up his own um, sin. So now, in chapter 12, about a year has passed. Because the baby's been born, right? We, we were told in chapter 11, it, the pregnancy had just occurred. So now full term, we'll see later the baby's uh, born. So most people think it's been about a year. And David has had all that time now to repent. But up to this point, so far, he's uh, refused. Now God's been patient with him. And God is long-suffering. He's patient with us too and he gives people time to turn from their sin but if you won't if, if, if a person won't come to him like this like he wants then he will go to that person and to me it's very gracious that he does that and the way that God begins here in that process this first phase of the four phases is he sends David's close friend, Nathan, to confront him. He uses God, this, this guy he knows really well, to confront him. And you know, God will often do that, you know, to uh, bring someone along who's, who's close to you to correct you in, in something that's going wrong that you haven't got settled with the Lord. And that's what he does here with Nathan. So that's, we, we begin there in verse 1. He sent Nathan to David. Let's see what happens. And he goes on, and Nathan came to David and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Okay, so Nathan begins to tell a story, a little parable to make his point to David that God sent him uh, to do. And so he, 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 he illustrates this, this contrast of you've got the one man who has lots <laughs> And the other, who's just got this one little lamb, it's like a, a family member, right? It's like you guys and your dogs. I've seen you on Instagram. I know what's going on. It happens at our house, too, you know? I was, I was remembering that whenever uh, uh, someone comes home from our family and they walk in the door, usually the pattern is they'll say hello to the other people, humans, <laughs> and then they'll go to our little dog, go, hi, Bill, how are you doing? And scratch her little head, you know, and pet her and things like that. Because she's 
part of our family too, right? And a lot of people uh, are like that. This guy apparently lets the thing drink out of his cup, which is kind of weird, but he does it uh, anyway. So um, you get the picture, right? The, the lamb here in this parable is a family pet. It's not just a farm animal, okay? He loves it. And a traveler, verse 4, came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Okay, so you get what's happening, right? The, the guy with abundance takes the other's only lamb, this family member, right, that he loves. And Nathan uses this, this parable to, to really just kind of emphasize how mean and selfish the rich guy. Yes. And then he is essentially pre presenting it to David and saying, okay, David, so you be the judge. What should be done? And, and we saw what David said, right? He, he's like kind of harsh <laughs> about the situation. He's like, what a jerk. <laughs> Put that guy to death. Oh, and he should restore four times to make up for it too. David's really preaching it, isn't he? <laughs> and you know what? He's right. There should be consequences for this kind of behavior. There should be restoration, restitution. Okay, so Nathan's not done, and here it comes. Verse 7 says, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Whoa. I bet he didn't see that one coming. <laughs> he thought they were talking about someone else. <laughs> it's easy to, you know, um, when uh, I was a, a new Christian, we lived in California, and I went to, um, our church was Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and Pastor Chuck Smith was the pastor and the, and the main teacher, and I don't know how many times I heard him say, our sins look really bad on other people, <laughs> because they do, don't they? You know, often we're just blind to what we're doing, but we can clearly see the problem in everybody else. Look at that guy. Look what he's doing. And it's really the same thing that we're doing. It's like it, we justify our own actions, but if you do the same thing, shame on you. And that's what David's doing. He can call it out. That's who he is. That's why Nathan says, you're the man. And it's not like in golf when they're like, you're the man. And it's not like that. It's you're the man who did this. He busts him. And you know, this is really good that this happens. And it's really good that God gets specific about stuff. And he's going to get specific. Because oftentimes, um, when the Lord convicts us, we'll just kind of think generally about sin. You know, like, well, maybe you'll be reading your Bible tomorrow. And you'll read something and, and you'll think, boy, I should be more loving. And it's true. None of us are loving enough. We should be more loving. But what the Lord will often do then is show you precisely how you're not loving. Like maybe show me like how, how bitter I've been about someone or, or that you've been gossiping or slandering or, or hatred towards somebody. You see the, the specifics, right? And, and, and this is part of the confrontation that Nathan's going to do with David is show him specifics. And so next... He spells it out for him, what he did. Let's look at verse um, 7, the second half of it. He says, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you have taken his wife to be your wife. 
and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Wow. God knows everything that David has done. You know, he, he looked like at the end of chapter 11, it looked like he got away with it, didn't it? Until it said, you know, the Lord saw it. The Lord was disappointed. The Lord despised it, the evil that he did. And so that's how Nathan knows, because God told him, showed him what David did. And what David did is break several of the Ten Commandments, God's moral law. Did you um, notice here that even though David didn't actually, or I should say technically, kill Uriah, that God still holds him account accountable for engineering the whole thing? He does. And, and this is what God does. You know, one day, the Bible testifies at the end of our Bibles that there's going to be a judgment. It's called the Great White Throne Judgment. And that's where all the sinners will stand to give an account for their life. Um, Christians won't stand at the great white throne judgment because our sins have been forgiven through Jesus Christ. We put our trust in him and then all my sins are gone. I don't pay for those because he paid for them. But if someone resists the gospel and Jesus their whole life and forgiveness, one day they will stand at the great white throne uh, judgment. And when they do, these are the kind of things that are going to be revealed. The Bible says it's all, all their works will be revealed. So I take that to mean not just the direct things that we do, but the indirect things too. Like the Pharisees. Remember the Pharisees when the, in the ministry of Jesus and the Gospels? And the Pharisees often thought they were, they were innocent and perfect before God because, you know, they, they did, hadn't, for example, actually touched a woman that wasn't their wife, you know, hadn't like done anything sexual with her. But Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you committed adultery to God, right? Because it's not just the action, even though the actions are sin too in that case, but it's the thoughts and intents of our heart too that is on display before God. He knows everything. It's all things are naked and open before the Lord. And so you guys... This is why we need forgiveness. All are guilty before God. Every human being. And we need forgiveness. And we can't stress this enough. God said there through Nathan that he gave David so much and yet he went out and wanted more. He just wasn't satisfied. I want more. And how many Christians, believers, have fallen into things they shouldn't be doing just because they weren't satisfied with what they had? It's probably most. <laughs> now, there's a really great exhortation in the Bible to help us with this problem that some of us can have. And I wanted to show it to you. It's from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Look how Paul put it. He said, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Can we all say that together as a group? Now godliness with contentment is great gain. It is. It, a godly person who's content with what God has given them will flourish. <laughs> but if you're not, if you're discontent, if you're like David... It could cause you to start walking in darkness trying to get what doesn't belong to you. And that's what he did. If he had walked in the light like that verse is in the light, then he wouldn't be in this mess to begin with. But now it's going to leave a mark, and a really bad mark uh, on him. And we'll find out more about it. Let's read verses 10 through 12 together. It says, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me. This is King David, a man after God's own heart, because you have despised me, the Lord said, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you, 
from your own house. And I will take your wives from before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it in secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. He says there's going to be consequences. Consequences. Because you despised me. Now I want you, if you would please, just take note that sin affects our relationship with God. Now that's pretty evident if just like your garden variety um, non-Christian, we get that. But believers, sin in their life affects their relationship with God. Not that it removes you from the place of salvation, but it breaks fellowship with God. And John in the New Testament picks up on that. He said, if we say we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. There's a place where believers can walk in darkness. And God's urging us to not do that. And when, it, and when, when we do veer off the trail like he has then that has to be resolved. And he hasn't resolved it yet. And that's why it's causing all this anguish and heartache. And, I mean, he's, he's resolved it now. All right, he should, does in the next verse, I should say. But up until this point, uh, he hasn't. And so because of that, those things we just read in verses 10 to 12, those are going to be the outcomes. His sons are going to fight with each other and kill each other. Uh, it starts in the next chapter. Uh, His son Absalom is going to be nothing but trouble for David. And actually later, I think in chapter 16, he disgraces the whole monarchy, David's kingdom, with with having uh, intimacy with the concubines on the roof of the palace. So everybody can see it, just like it said there in verse 12. It's a prophetic word of this, all the mess that this has brought on. David brought it into his home, and now he's going to be plagued with family problems. And everybody's going to know it. It's such a bummer. Brought it on himself. It didn't have to be that way. It's going to leave a mark. Years of grief. Like, really, the rest of the book of 2 Samuel is going to have some of this stuff in it. Everywhere you go. So again, I might have mentioned this when we we began, but I wanted to emphasize something with you. This right here is probably the second main reason that this is recorded in the Bible. You know, do you guys ever do that when you're reading the scriptures? Do you ever sit there and go, why is this in the Bible? Like, I do that almost every time I read it, to try and, like, give the Lord an opportunity to tell me what the main point is. And first... One of the reasons that this is recorded is so that you and I will know that God has grace for sinners. And we're going to see that in a big way here in the rest of our time this morning. But second, so that you and I would avoid unnecessary suffering. All this is unnecessary. So, that's the confrontation phase. Sends his buddy, Nathan... Go tell David that we know, I know, and there's going to be problems because of this. Well, part two, or phase two, I call confession. Confession. So we're going to walk in the light. We've got to confess, <laughs> get back in the light. And here's what David does, verse 13. So he said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin, and you shall not die. Boy, it's such a good uh, thing that he just did. (laughs) He's like, I did it. I sinned against God. Did you notice that he doesn't try to make excuses? Because that's typically where folks go, you know, to justify, you know. Well, I didn't. See, Nathan, I didn't really have a good relationship with my dad, so, you know, it's not really my fault. Um, She came on to me first. (laughs) 
my wives, you know, I know I have a bunch of wives, but they don't really understand me. None of that stuff, right? Doesn't make excuses, doesn't try to justify it, just six simple words. I have sinned against God. I guess that's five. <laughs> the Lord, that's six. That's why I messed that up. I can really ruin a moment, can't I, sometimes in IT? Sorry about that. So this is great, because now the healing can begin, right? Because he's like, yep, I did it. And I can imagine that David in that moment is just like wanting a fresh start. I mean, doesn't everybody want a fresh start after messing up? I know I do. <laughs> so look how simple it is. Just a confession. Talk to God. Tell him. And also, I, one thing that really jumped out at me there in verse 13 is that God is much more gracious than David was. Remember, David wanted that guy to die for the lamb incident in the story, right? The parable. But God doesn't want David to die. The law said that adulterers should be put to death. But in his grace, God is forgiving his sins and he said, you shall not um, die. He puts it away, we're told there. Remembers it no more. I love that psalm where it says, it's, it's as cast as far as the east as the west from you. That's pretty far. <laughs> Hey, oh, and by the way, you know, you know that that statement, I put it away, is true because this isn't brought up in the New Testament. Even though David is mentioned tons of times in the New Testament, it's never about this. It's always like good stuff, you know? And it, because he said there in verse 13, God has put away his sin. So confession, so important. And you don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to go to me. You can go right to God. Confess to him. Now, sometimes people won't go to, go to God to confess because they see it as just this unbelievably painful thing to do. But I kind of see this as it's probably a relief for David. I mean, can you imagine what he went through that whole year that he didn't? And the whole, you know, the baby's coming. He's thinking about Uriah, all that stuff. Actually, did you know that he wrote a psalm all about this that tells us the background and what he was thinking and the way he was feeling? Can you guys turn with me there for a few minutes? And we're, we're going to come back to 2 Samuel 12. We left off. But go to Psalm 51 with me, would you? And I just want to read some of it to you and make a few comments because uh, it's kind of like reading David's prayer journal here. You know, somebody keeps a prayer journal, what they're feeling, stuff they're going through. You kind of look over his shoulder and see what was going on. So let's read, look at this together. Uh, would you, with me? Psalm 51, it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. So we know this is directly attributed to that situation. He says in verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. You see, he, he doesn't want this anymore. Blot it out. Like it's up to you, God, to get rid of this thing. Wash me, verse 2, thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. This is really interesting to me. You see, when you read this, this psalm, it's not the punishment that he wants to be free from. It's the sin itself. It's causing him anguish, heartache. You know, somebody said that um, sin, in this case, it's like a red stain on his soul. And nobody can get it out of there except for God. And isn't that the truth? I mean, we can't even get grass stains out of jeans. <laughs> we certainly can't get sin out of our soul. And we need God. He's the only one that can cleanse us from unrighteousness. 
For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Looks like he's thinking about it constantly. You know, that's a rough year for this guy. But now he's starting to own it. And that's good. Verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found when, found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. This is uh, also kind of curious because we know that there's a lot of other people that were affected by his sin, right? There's Uriah, there's the baby, there's Bathsheba. Remember Joab got sucked into it too in chapter 11, his general. All the other guys who died because of that incident and... And so they're obviously affected, but his point here is that God is the one that's truly offended because they're God's rules. He's the one who came up with the commandments. I've sinned against you, God. Behold, he said, I was brought forth in iniquity and in my mother, and in sin my mother conceived me. He's, he's letting us know that it's his nature, and his nature has boiled up, right? And it's confirmed what was in him. It didn't have to in this case, but it's in there. Behold, verse 6, your desire, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. It's like, I want to be pure. I want to be like what you want. He's learned his lesson. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. He's, he's lost his joy. <laughs> Wants it back. That's what happens when a believer gets, starts walking in darkness. First thing that goes is the joy. Because fellowship with God is broken. Not that you can't get it back, but it's, there's a problem. And he recognizes that. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and block out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You know, do a work inside, God. Make me, make me new again. Do not cast me away. I'll finish with these. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. There it is again. Joy and fellowship. That's what he was missing <laughs> above all else because that's what's emphasized here. So there's no need to keep carrying around unconfessed sin to God. There's no need for it. Confess it to the Lord. That's what he learned from this. Now we know him. <laughs> okay, would you guys go back with me to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12? And we left off at, at verse 13. And remember that after he said, I sinned against the Lord, that Nathan said, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. It... Nathan is basically saying that God immediately forgives you. <laughs> and he does. He doesn't say, oh, oh, you're, you're sorry? Okay, um, well, let's wait about six months and see if you're real genuine in this. God knows your heart. He knows if you're just saying it or if you mean it. And, and it, it's forgiven just like that. Now, there's consequences to it, and that's what we're going to find out next. Right? He, he, he's, he's confessed it, which is good, but the third phase now is consequences. This is the mark that it can leave. So we want to learn from this, too. So let's read verse 14, and here's what Nathan said. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Okay, so the penalty for his sin has been taken care of, and, and that's what's tried to illustrate to us in verse 13, he shall not die, because that would have been the penalty, right, for adultery to him. But he's not going to die. 
So the penalty is taken care of. But the consequences, they're just beginning. Not only is this child going to die, but three other of his sons are going to die also. And people are going to blaspheme God because of this. Look at David. He gets away with everything. God's not just. Look what he did. Well, God is just. And what we're going to be shown here is the principle of reaping and sowing. Right? We, we will reap what we've sown. You know, I've known enough people who've come out of um, ruined lives. <laughs> like, I, I came out of a ruined life when I came to know Christ. And, and people who come out of those kind of backgrounds, I know it's not everybody, but they often think that, well, because God has forgiven me, then all of that should be done now. <laughs> but there's, the consequences often continue for a while, because, especially in the eyes of the world, because... Um, our world doesn't really understand forgiveness of sin and, and grace. And so, for example, say you've got a former drug addict thief who gets saved. It doesn't mean that people are going to automatically trust that guy. You know? It's sort of like a picture crawling out of a train wreck. You know? You, you, you're, you alive, you, you, you made it through the crash of the train, but everything around you is kind of a twisted disaster mess. And it takes some time to crawl out from that. But the good news is that God is faithful. And if you, you give him some time to work, he, 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 he does restore and he loves to restore. And many of you know what I'm talking about. consequences often continue when we walk in darkness because it's a mark so Nathan then in verse 15 departed to his house and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David and it became ill David therefore pleaded with God for the child and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground so the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground. But he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Okay, so because of the scandal that this has caused in Israel, the consequences are here to make an example. That child is going to die. And I don't pretend to understand why God chooses to do it like this in this particular case. That's his business, and I'm just reporting the facts here. I try to reconcile it, I try to understand these things, and, and, but I'm not going to explain it away. He's got his reasons. David doesn't understand it either, so he's spending a week here fasting and praying and begging God to change his mind. And so this is here, you guys, I think, because these are the sort of things that God tries to get us away from having to face. Pain and anguish, consequences that sin causes. And all of this could be avoided if he would have just walked in the light instead. Well, then on the seventh day, verse 18, it came to pass that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, he wouldn't heed our voice. How can we tell him that he's dead? He may do us some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering, he perceived that the child was dead. And therefore David said to them, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So what a sad day, isn't it? It's crushing what's happening here. And once again, you know, as if for a teaching moment, Scripture consistently shows us that Sin eventually leads to death. If you carry it out far enough, it does. And that's what's happened here. So David, in verse 20, arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. 
You might want to circle that part and remember that. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Hmm. Then he went to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. He's eating dinner now. Then his servant said to him, Why is it that you... What, what is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? He's like, who knows what God might do? I don't know what God will do. You know, so I just pray. It doesn't hurt to try. <laughs> There's a little tip for you. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. I mean, it didn't work in this case. You, you know, most of prayer is just to get on God's side of things, not to try and change his mind. But we don't know what the Lord will do. Fast and pray. It doesn't hurt to try. Now, the thing that really it ministers to me personally here is that when something really bad happened to him, he goes to worship God. Like, wow. Like, who does that? Do you do that? A lot of people don't. You know, I've been around the church for an, enough years to know that oftentimes when, when, when things that are bad going on, people will hole up and stay away from other believers and stay away from church and stop singing to the Lord and stop reading um, their Bible. They withdraw instead of pressing in. And I think that we could learn something from this one moment right here that could benefit you for the rest of your life. When uh, my wife and I were first married, we moved to Idaho and we knew no one so when we started going to our church, uh, I would, I, we agreed that we were going to go to a small group so that we could get to know other people. And, um, and the group that we went to was a newly married uh, group. And we'd been married for like a month or two at this point. <laughs> and so we really needed to go. <laughs> and uh, you know, it was really interesting that I was taught, and I still remember it to this day, is that there was about six or seven couples that were in the group, and we were all married for less than a year, I think. And um, uh, <laughs> we would take turns each week, the couples showing up to that group where you could tell something was really not going well with that couple, you know, fighting on the way there. I mean, we did our fair share of this. Our, our marriage initially was kind of volatile because we're both kind of, you know, my wife is a lot sweeter than me, but we're both kind of type A's. And so, you know, type A is kind of go, and so we were doing that a lot initially, and I don't know why I'm telling you this, but, um, so sorry, Chelsea, but, uh, <laughs> so, but we would go to that group, and like, you could tell when someone would walk in the door, and they were fighting on the way over, and the girl's crying, and they're like, yeah, we're here, you know, that kind of thing, and, you know, can't wait to do the Bible study with you guys, and, and we did some of that, and, but you know, like, the fellowship, and the worship, and the word, and praying with each other, man, it did something. And I learned, even though I'm not perfect at it, obviously, but I learned that when something's not going well, don't withdraw, press in. Like, we should see you more when things are going bad. Because this is where God's people are. This is where worship. I mean, it's not the only place, obviously. But we should want to be taught and encouraged and helped. It's good. So that's what he did. And, but it's so sad, isn't it, that little baby died. But it's David's fault. It's part of the consequences of his sin. Well, phase four is some good news here for us, and we're going to look at our last part, and it's, uh, I call this comfort. So phase four of getting back on track uh, is comfort, and here's what it said in verse 23, but now he's dead. 
Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. You know what David's talking about here? Life after death. <laughs> this isn't it, folks. <laughs> there is life after death. And he's confident, pretty confident, <laughs> that he's going to see that boy again. Isn't that something? This is comforting. It should be comforting for you, especially for parents who've lost a child. I mean, what comfort for a parent who's lost a little, a little child? David said, he can't come back to me, obviously, but I'm going to go see him. Wow. This just like so blesses me because I'm looking forward to the resurrection. Because in the resurrection, one of the great things about it is you're going to be reunited with loved ones. I was thinking of all the people that I know that are believers that went before me and you know, like family and stuff. And um, my mom, she died um, when she was 49 of cancer and she died a Christian and I wasn't a believer yet. So we never got to share any of this together. I didn't know what to do when she was sick. My grandfather was a preacher, a pastor of an Assembly of God church when I was a boy. And he went to heaven before I became a Christian. And we never got to talk about any of this. Like, I would love to talk with him right now. But one day, I'm going to get to see him. And we can spend 10,000 years talking about it, you know? All those people who go before you that love Jesus, you're going to go to them. They won't come back here. And you know, that said, I believe that what he just said there is an indication that God has a special place in his heart for babies who die. Remember Jesus said, let the little children come to me for such is the kingdom of heaven. Babies hold a special place, little kids for God. It seems like that there's an age of accountability that, you know, I think every person has to make a decision for Christ. Yes or no? <laughs> Choose life, the Bible urges us. And I think there's a day that, that comes. But what happens if you die when you're too little? You know, as an infant or something. Well, I believe that God is merciful. Like, how could he hold that little child accountable? Um, <laughs> Um, I was just talking to our worship leader, Andy, about this, that, you know, as Abraham, he was talking to the Lord and he said, won't the, won't the, the, the just, won't the judge of all the earth do right? And God didn't res dispute that claim because the, the judge of all the earth will do right. And I believe one of them is when it comes to little kids. Right? And I think we see that there with David. So that's a big comfort uh, to him. And maybe it's a comfort to you. I hope it is. Especially if you've had something like this happen in your life. Well, there's more comfort to come here. Look at verse 24. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in to her and lay with her. So she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him, and he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Oh, you know what's happening here? It's just more grace from God given to them. He's essentially giving them a second chance. Because God loves to give people second chances. Not only does God comfort them in the death of this child, you know, through it, but he's also given them another child. David seems like he's really excited about it, doesn't he? He's like, Nathan, get over here. We've had another boy. We're calling him Solomon. You know, he's all excited if he had a cell phone. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but Nathan shows up and he says, actually, you know, God calls him Jedidiah. That means beloved of the Lord. You know, he's got something in store for this boy. The Lord loves him real special way so what a great comfort for them to have that and speaking of comfort I want to give you a little homework assignment if you choose to do so accept your mission 
And that's sometime maybe later today or tomorrow. Don't do it now because we're going to have communion here in a minute. But read Psalm 32. Because I believe that Psalm 32 is, was written as a result of this whole situation. Like what it looks like after all is said and done. And um, it starts with this one phrase that I heard when I was a new Christian. And I remember it to this day. It said, blessed or oh how happy is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Oh, how happy is the man or woman whose sins are forgiven by God. You know, David goes on in that psalm and he, he talks about all the turmoil he was in because he was stubborn, but now he's free. <laughs> it's great. Oh, how happy, you know. To me, that's the greatest comfort. To, to be liberated, to walk in the light, that's why it's so important to get off the path of the darkness if that's where you're at, believer. God wants you to walk in the light. Now, maybe you're not a Christian yet. And I talked to you for a moment earlier, and I just wanted to circle back with that now. If you agree with these things I've been saying here today, because it's the truth, and you would like a full pardon for your sins, you can have it. The Bible says we just need to believe and repent. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. Ask God to forgive you of those things. And, and you can believe, begin a new life today simply by asking. The old things will pass away. All things will become new. And there's, there's no good reason to carry all this stuff around with you any longer. Just take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord. Well, I'm going to let you read the rest of the chapter on your own uh, due, to, due to time. I want to um, enjoy communion with you guys. But can I just give you a quick summary? And you can go read it for yourself. Uh, <clears throat> this last part is, is telling us that God not only um, forgives David, but he restores David. He's like, okay, David, now I know that you messed up, but I've got things for you to do. You, you're useful for the, for the kingdom still. And this is so important for you to know, guys, because oftentimes when Christian, Christians blow it, we think, I can never be used by God again. It's ruined my witness. But when God forgives, he means it. And he loves to restore people. That's another comfort. There's all kinds of comfort in here. You should be, feel comforted. Because <laughs> where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Amen? Well, at this time, I'd like to ask the worship team to come back up to uh, sing a song or two. Uh, and as they do, as a reminder uh, about communion, you know, the way that we can be forgiven is because somebody else pays. It's not that God just forgets it all, like, okay, I, I won't count that against you. No, um, Jesus pays. God can put away your sin and my sin because Jesus is your substitute. Do you see the Old Testament saints like David were looking forward to the Savior to pay for their sins? You and I know who he is, right? And so the bread that we're going to share in, in just a moment, that represents his body that was broken for you, that he suffered on account of your sins and my sins. The juice speaks of his blood that was shed to pay off your debt and my debt. And so we receive them as an act of gratitude and remembrance and fellowship. And so uh, the ushers are going to come forward now and serve you. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, you are free to enjoy communion with us, even if you're just visiting here. If you're not yet, then it's best to let it pass and consider these things that have been said. But my question is, why not put your faith in Jesus Christ right now? You're here. Be forgiven. If you're ready, God is ready. He loves you. That's why he did this for you. So be saved. Put your trust in the Lord.